We're going to deviate this Lord's Day and for the next three Lord's Day, as I plan, to move in to speak on a subject a little bit different than the law of God. We're going to be looking, rather than it's a law, we're going to look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this came out of a study that Dr. Crampton and I were doing on this passage, trying to ascertain certain answers to why certain things are said or done in the way that they are. And so I thought with as much work as I had done, uh, I would go ahead and move forward toward the aspect of preaching these uh, because I just really was running out of time to get myself ready to go with the continuation on teaching the law of God. So if you don't mind, this Lord's Day we're going to look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This is the sermon text for us. Beginning at verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who would want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, that's Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to examine your holy word this Lord's Day. We ask, O oh God, that you would direct us in understanding the great truth that is being taught here by our Lord in order that we might understand the significance of your holy kingdom. We ask now, O God, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which your word and spirit would teach us in this hour, in Christ's name, amen. 
by way of introduction. This is, as I said, a parable given by our Lord with an understanding that the contextual background to this parable helps us better to understand it. And we'll see that as we develop the actual parable itself. Within this context, I also want you to note that parables are taught normally on the basis of Semitic understanding than they are on some type in Aristotelian Greek interpretation. This parable is focused on the kingdom of God. And it also speaks to the unrighteous use of mammon. That is money. It talks about selfishness and the eventual final estate via the judgment of man by God. This is, once again, our Lord in all of his brilliance weaving the doctrine of the law of God and of the prophets into a theme on the kingdom of God that has been promised in the covenant and the establishment of that kingdom and the expansion of that kingdom and the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is tied to it. And what we're being shown here is that man must not trust in his own ability or wealth, thinking that he has been blessed by God and his wealth is that type of a mark that God shows his goodness upon him when in reality, the truth is, in the providence of God, those things given by God sometimes are a means to hang us, as it were, in the final judgment. And we do not realize it until it's too late. How many people in the common goodness of God have great wealth today, have really, in a sense, been blessed, and yet what they're going to find out in the judgment day, those things they receive that has come from God and all things come from him, were not to, as it were, show his blessing upon them, but they were used as a snare to entrap them into their sin and debauchery, their unrighteousness of life, and that which they thought was a blessing from God becomes nothing more than a curse. And it traps us, those who would participate in that, those who would not do as the gospel requires of them, those who will not live according to the kingdom precepts of the word, it binds them up to judgment by God. In this parable, judgment that when one realizes such judgment, it's too late. And there is no turning back. And there is no mercy being shown whatsoever concerning the torment of their eternal state. Our Lord was just speaking about these things in Luke 16. Let me give you a little bit of a background context to it just by looking at two verses of the scripture that I think can give you the idea of what I have just laid out to you. In verse 16 of Luke 16, he says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. and Everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle 
of the law to fail. God's law is a part of his covenant that he has given to us in redemption. It is not that we are saved by the meritorious effort of keeping the law of God, as we have heard in our catechism this morning, but it is works of necessity that accompany such redemption. That there is a standard that God has given us in how we are to conduct ourselves in his kingdom. That's the background to this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Thus, let us turn our attention to this parable and let us continue to think about what the story is principally illustrating the truth of God about his kingdom to us and about how one cannot ignore the importance of God's law and commandment in the kingdom for us as we are to live our lives as sanctified saints. Well, if you will, let's begin at verse 19. And a certain man was rich and was clothed in purple and fine linen, making merry extravagantly every day. Now, I'm, by the way, if you can't follow the translation here, you'll know it's not one type of translation, but I am actually working to try to express what the language of the Greek is saying to us. And so, if it doesn't read exactly like it normally does in my New King James Version, it's because I didn't use it for this particular series that we're looking at. Here you have this parable of the rich man. And what it says from the text is, he, in a parable, this is a story about the kingdom of God, and it relates itself to a truism about life. He more than likely represents the wealthy of Israel. Most likely, we might say he's one of the leaders in Israel. He is, in a sense, representing clearly the wealthy, but also the rank and file of Jewish government and the colors that were also noted of the priesthood. Thus, his purple clothing and fine linen, white, which represents that very priesthood. And yet the purple, a royalty. Thus, the idea of leadership. This is one of the young leaders who is wealthy in Israel. And here you see in this story at the time of Israel. This is long before you have all the troubles that come upon Israel and then the judgment that is cast upon Israel in AD 70. And here you have the state of the Jews in that day, at least the wealthy. They are, as it were, lavishing their wealth. They were being extravagant. That is to say, they were excessive and wasteful or inefficient in the goodness that God had granted to them and the wealth they were enjoying. In a sense, we could say that essentially they were eating and drinking and they were making merry, not giving any thought about their life, for they thought they had the Old Testament promises to the good life, to those blessings of the covenant. They could have joy and wealth, and they were living that, as it were, dream, as promised by God in his covenant to them. 
They had their eyes on the things of this world. Wealth, joy, extravagant living, just, just lavishing themselves in the abundance of the material things of life. And there is an illustration in this that often when we have many material things, we are thinking less about the kingdom of God and more about the material things of life. The enjoyment of life, we're seeking the pleasure of the flesh and we're not seeking those things of the kingdom of God. And so we need to take a great amount of time to consider this very thing that our Lord is teaching us in this parable. And they basically believe, well, if God wanted to punish us, he would have certainly given us all this. And is that not even the thinking of many who, if they have any religion left, of the liberals, it is I cannot be this wealthy and be under the judgment of God. People live that way. They were not seeking the kingdom of God first, but rather they were seeking their own pleasure and fulfilling their needs, but with a greater abundance, with that extravagance of lavishing himself with those many things. Eating, drinking, making merry, doing all the things that they could do because they had a great life to live. Not to say that all people have that in Israel, but the contrast here is those who had versus those who have not. It teaches us something about life, about the things God expects from us in this life. We're told in Matthew 6, 33, Christ speaking, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Doesn't mean right now. But it's in those things that are promised in the fullness of the redemption. The day is coming when the promises of God will be realized in our life. In a way that we shall be blessed. We shall have joy, rest, peace, comfort from this world. All of our needs met. but when we will be so transformed in who we are. Our desire will be to seek after God, and he adds and cares for us in his kingdom. And so it is, we have this duty. Now he goes on to verse 20. And there was a certain poor man by the name of Lazarus. Poor here means literally, this is a man who is basically been beaten up by life. He didn't have anything. No wealth to speak of. He is literally what we would call, a, in our day even to this day, a poor man. Not just poor. He has nothing. He was laid at the porch, or if you will, gate, full of sores. How poor is he? He doesn't even have enough food to sustain him, and his body is overcome with sores. He's oozing out that life that he needs to have in order to live, and he's just full of sores. I mean, this is not just poor. This is at the bottom of the barrel, poor. It doesn't get any worse than this. I mean, this is not a hillbilly, as it were, living up in the Appalachian Mountains, who maybe don't have a lot. This guy has nothing. 
He doesn't have her. Anything whatsoever. He's laying at the gate begging from the rich man. He has nothing. Hard to imagine because most of us have never lived in that situation. We've never been where we've had nothing. We've never been where we haven't been able to go to doctors. When we have open sores but our own body. That's how poor this guy is. That's how filthy this guy is. Here in this representation, you have Lazarus, who is a type of Christ, who was mistreated and rejected by the Second Temple Judaism of his day. And it has a disdain for him, this Jesus of Nazareth, who proclaimed that he was the Christ of the lineage of the Messiah, the prince of the divinical line. He represents him who was rejected by Israel. Remember, this is an understanding of the kingdom of God and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it deals in particular, being Semitic, with Israel itself. Thus in John 1, 11, we are told, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. To this, John Calvin states, and I quote, here is displayed the absolutely desperate wickedness and malice of men. Here is displayed their exact exemplary impiety that when the Son of God was manifest in the flesh to the Jews whom God had separated to himself from the other nations to be his own heritage, he was not acknowledged or received. Out of all the nations the Jews were called out of the earth of Chaldees God calls them out, creates a nation to receive the Messiah. And when he sends the Messiah to them, they reject him. He sends him as one who is humble. One who has nothing to be desired of this earth. Nothing that people would go, oh, this is a wealthy guy. We want him to be with us. Just the opposite. Most likely was revolt, revolted, re, I'm sorry, revolted, revolted, I guess is the right word, because he's poor. He has these open sores. He has nothing. It's not the kind of guy you invite to your dinner party. You know what I'm saying? Not at all. And that's the contrast that is, even in that generation, here being compared. Here you have the wealthy of Israel, the royalty of Israel, the rich man who represents that very thing of Israel, and now you have Lazarus the poor man. Lazarus the man who has sores. The Lazarus who represents Christ. Who has nothing. Who will suffer for his people. And yet his people will not accept him. The Apostle Paul told us in Romans chapter 1, in verses 1 through 7, who this Messiah, Jesus Christ, was. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated the gospel of God, which he promised before through his holy prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, 
who was born to the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome. Here he says, called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This was what was prophesied about him. And so we have this depiction, this image, this representation of the story. And you can see it begin to shape up. You have the rich man, the rich, the wealthy, the leadership of Israel, the people of God who had separated them out from the nations. And here you have Lazarus who comes who represents Christ. And he's rejected and he's despised. Well, then he goes on to verse 21, part A. And desiring to be filled, or if you will, the word here would be fed, from the crumbs that are falling from the table of the rich man. This is why he's come. This speaks of the fact that Christ was hungry. If you remember, he said that, but they fed him not. He expresses that in the way that when they come, even representing him, when they don't hearken to his call, as they have done it unto even his own, they have done it to him. Jesus said that he himself had no place to rest his head in Matthew 8 and in verse 28, or verse 20, excuse me. Here he says to us, and Jesus said to them, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He did not come as the wealthy of Israel. He did not have among them the position of royalty. That is to say, nobility. He was not of the priesthood. He's depicted as a poor man who has come. Come to be the Messiah of Israel. What were they looking for? They were looking for a man of wealth, a man of power. A man who could raise a large army and avenge Israel. Build this kingdom that would conquer all the nations of the world. I don't believe they ever once dreamed that the kingdom he would build and the army that he would raise would never have to fire a shot, lift a sword to expand its borders. Simply through the gospel, he could save nations. Thus, our Lord Jesus Christ says to us in Matthew 25 and in verse 41 through 46, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I'm just quoting these things that Christ has said. Remember, this all feeds into the gospel and the kingdom. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. They, Jesus said, did not minister to him. 
Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There are those who, in a sense, have ministered to the people of God, of which Jesus Christ represents. The true Israel, if you will, of the covenant. Not those outward covenant people who were separated by God, but not really of true Israel. Remember what Paul said? Not all of Israel is of true Israel. And so it is here our Lord has come to them seeking to be fed, seeking to be ministered to. He comes seeking food from the wealthy, from the rich man's table. His dogs, that is, the dogs that are spoken of here, supposedly belonging to the rich man, they get to eat the crumbs under their master's table. He thought at least of the lowest creature you could have had, dogs, I could at least eat with the dogs and been fed. Well, in this latter part of verse 21, he says, Yea, also the dogs coming were licking his sores. This licking of the sores of Lazarus, you can imagine, it's the nature of dogs. You got a cut, dog come up and lick it. You got a sore, the dog come up and lick it. That's how dogs tend to heal themselves. They lick their wounds in order to try to heal them. And here's this poor man, open sores, looking for food, cannot even be ministered to, to take care of his health, and you have the dogs coming. And they're licking the poor man. Which I think speaks historically of the Old Testament concerning the disgraceful life of one who would have to have even the dogs minister to him. They would consider him of low estate. They would consider him to be a disgrace to the nation. Yet, I think it may have a twofold sense here. Sometimes with parables, you don't always know exactly what's trying to be completely taught. Yet, the Lord was going to one day identify with those who were seen as the low lives in Israel. But what is interesting in this text is the dogs, as they alone, at this time, they were attending to him, not the wealthy man, not his servants, the dogs. In this context, we know the dogs themselves were, in a sense, kinder than their rich young master. At least they felt sorrow for the pain and the anguish that the rich, that the poor man Lazarus had in his life. Even so that the dogs, we might say, were humble enough. They humbled themselves to even come and minister to him. But we know this in the Old Testament. The dogs are representative of what? Gentiles. Whom Christ had also told in his ministry that he must bring them to, into his kingdom, into the heavenly fold. Thus, Abraham truly is the father of all those who believe. And in a biblical imagery here, this represents I believe the church of the Gentiles. Perhaps the faith of true Israel is being represented in their state of humility. A church that ministers to the poor. That seeks to minister to them whom 
they have a duty and responsibility to. Thus, Jesus has taught us in John 10, 14 through 16, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. I am sure in Israel that teaching went over, as they would say, like a lead balloon. If the Gentiles were equivalent to dogs, the last thing they wanted to hear from the Messiah was, guess what? I'm going to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom of God too. Had to be revolting unto the wealthy and the leadership in Israel. How dare he clutter our kingdom with the dogs of this world? But the dogs, they ministered to Lazarus when the rich man wouldn't feed him nor would he minister through his servants to him. Verse 20 to part A. And it came to pass that the poor man died. Note, if you will, this very carefully. And that he was carried away by the messengers to the bosom of Abraham. It's important here to note that Christ, in his parable, teaches about his death. But there is no reference to his burial. Why? because his burial is insignificant due to the resurrection. Look at the contrast, not being said of the rich man this way. The messengers, by the way, and this is all from that Semitic understanding, are the angelic hosts which the Jews believed when they died would carry them off from death to heaven, to the very bosom of Abraham, representing heaven, or the place of rejoicing, rest, and fellowship with other believing Jews who had died and gone on before them, especially Father Abraham. So here you have our Lord teaching a parable to the Jews who understand the background to it. He just said this poor man who had nothing but sores, no food, the lowest form of life you could have in Israel, he was living, he has been carried away when he dies by angels to the bosom of Abraham, to heaven. But one of the key things in all this, I think it's interesting, is that it also speaks of Christ dying prior to the destruction of Israel, and he was taken to the place only true believers could ever abode, and that is heaven. Two principles here in the parable. One, the soul is capable of existence when it is separated from the body. Two, the souls of those who are followers of Christ immediately pass to the intermediate state of heaven, waiting for the day of the resurrection of the body and the rejoining of the soul forever in the kingdom of God. Now we'll look at that much more in depth in the next few Sundays. Verse 22 says to us, part B, and the rich man also died and was buried. Now it's important here to note in our text that the rich man has died, he was buried, yet there is not one mention of the messengers, or if you will, the angelic host carrying him away. Why? Because he, speaking of Israel, had rejected the Messiah. And believing that there, they already had the promises, they thought he had it all wrapped up. And they were enjoying the good things. Thus they had a pass to heaven. 
as the very covenant nation of God. Thus there might have been, in a sense, a nationalistic theology of redemption going on. If you're a part of the nation of Israel, you're in the covenant. You're in. That's all there is to say. Live in that covenant. Live in the promises. Enjoy life that God is giving you. Pay no attention to other things being taught. You could say, like the Apostle Paul, you have the sign, you have the promises of the covenant and the law and the testimonies, when in reality... Their theology was not really what they were abiding by. It wasn't the theology of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That the Messiah was coming and they were welcome and accept and, and were to accept and believe in him and the work that he must do. Again, Israel following Second Temple Judaism at its time are far afield from the truth of Old Testament and especially the New as it represents the Christ, the Messiah. Thus, St. Paul, and I don't have time this week to look at it, says to us in Romans 2, 5 through 24, the very essence, the nature of what has taken place here at this time with the Jews. They were the teachers of Israel. And remember what Paul said? How is it you say that you're the teachers, but you're blind? You have no light whatsoever. You're violators of the law of God, and yet you try to teach others to keep the law. How do you think you live up to these very things? You do not. The rich man dies, and he's buried. The resounding understanding of that, he's buried and with no messengers coming. That's what happened, and they're buried. It's an indication of the end of his life and the judgment that is to come upon him. He is gone to Hades, to hell. He's going to that place of torment, not the promise that was given in the covenant, not the promise of the eternal reward. Why? You've rejected Messiah the Prince. He who is of the line of David, Jesus Christ. You did not minister to him. He came to you to be fed and to be clothed and to be taken care of, ministered to in his health. You did not do it, neither did your servants do it on your behest, but your dogs in their humility licked his sores. They ministered to him. We, who are Gentiles, we are those dogs. We are to be a ministering people. Not like Israel of old, but like true Israel. We've been given a duty and responsibility under Messiah the Prince to care for, to minister to those in this world who have nothing. What we have to give them may not be much, but the life and the promises that we can bring in the gospel be a great reward in the end. They cannot be, and they cannot be ignored. We must care for their souls and care for them physically. There is a need for the church as a whole visible upon this earth to minister to those who have need, that we may be able to bless them and minister to them and to care for them and their souls. Well, next Lord's Day, we'll go on to look at this parable because there's a lot important here to take a look at, yet much to be considered as it's being set up by our Lord to where you really get to the important point of what he's going to make concerning 
the dialogue between the rich man and Father Abraham. May we think on these things because it's so important that we do not reject the kingdom, its purpose, and the rules and commands that God has given to us in this life. Shall we pray?